All right. Thank you all for coming to this special Frontiers in Neuroscience seminar. Uh, this is a seminar that's co-hosted by the Center for Mind, Brain, and Culture in Emory College. And I am uh, the associate director. Deet Stout here is the director of CNBC. Um, and I'll just tell you a little bit about the CNBC first before we switch it over to the neuroscience graduate students who will do the introduction for Dr. Banerjee. Uh, but the CNBC is, whoops, wrong one. Is this the right one? Okay, there we go. Uh, our mission is really to support and foster interdisciplinary research um, and conversations across the campus. And we do that with the help of a group of faculty, um, not only myself and, and Dietz, but also an advisory committee from across uh, the college, including both uh, uh, the sciences, the social sciences, and, and the humanities. These are uh, some of the tiles that illustrate the kinds of activities and things that the CNBC does, including um, uh, providing opportunities for lunching and learning with experts, uh, workshops, sponsoring symposia and conferences, uh, and we're always open to new ideas. So if you have an idea, please reach out to us. We host an undergraduate uh, research fellows each year. Um, these are the three fellows that we have for the current year um, that have the opportunity to meet uh, experts um, uh, in our faculty, um, get a little bit of funding for their research, um, and we also host a certificate program for graduate students. Um, one of our own graduate uh, uh, neuroscience graduate students is, is among this year's uh, cohorts, a very active uh, group of, of uh, scholars. Uh, so this is more detail about our certificate program. Um, we host a bunch of events throughout the year. Uh, and so now we're in spring and we have a bunch of lunches, some, a mixer that's coming up for new faculty that we'll point you to, um, and, uh, and then uh, a workshop at the uh, end of the year on sense and salience. Um, if you ever miss our activities, we keep an active archive. And in fact, this uh, presentation will be added to that archive. Um, and so you can always find material there. Um, we, uh, if you want to reach out to us, well, here we are in all sorts of social media channels. Um, and if you'd like to join as an affiliate, uh, take a take a shot of this um, QR code and and please reach out. You can also come to our um, mixer in the middle of February. All right. So now I'm going to put on my other hat as a neuroscience program director and turn it over to our students who, because this is our Frontiers in Neuroscience seminar series for our students, um, they play a role in introducing and meeting um, our speakers. So I'll turn it over to Elle and Lucas. Great. Hi, everyone. We'd like to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Arkarup Banerjee, who is hosted today by the Center for Mind, Brain, and Culture. Dr. Banerjee received his PhD in 2016 from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, where he studied the olfactory system with Dr. Florin Albianu. His research focus transitioned to investigating the role of the motor cortex in mouse vocalizations during his postdoc in Dr. Michael Long's lab at NYU. Since returning to Cold Spring Harbor as an assistant professor in 2020, Dr. Banerjee has continued to study neural circuits responsible for vocal communication in singing mice. His career, his early career contributions have been recognized through the Searle Scar Scholar Program and the Klingenstein Simons Fellowship. Dr. Banerjee's lab explores questions about sensory motor transformations, vocal communication, and behavioral flexibility that are highly relevant to our neuroscience community here at Emory. So we are excited to hear his talk titled Neurocircuits for Communication Insights from the Singing Mice. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Really delighted to be here. Um, I've had a wonderful meeting so far with many of you and looking forward to meeting more of you through the day. I'm really excited to share with you our adventures with these Costa Rican singing mice in search for neural circuits for vocal communication. But I would like to start by 
pointing to you this famous image from Tinbergen and pose this question, is it a goose or is it a hawk? Well, it depends. If you ask a chicken by placing this over the head of the chicken and moving this from left to right, the chicken shows a fear response. But if you do the same thing by moving the same image from right to left, the chicken is fine. This provides a striking example of how brains and neural circuits can extract relevant sensory information from stimuli and guide appropriate species typical behaviors. And of course, there are many such examples in our natural world, starting from this cheetah trying to chase its lunch to uh, the zebra finch male trying to woo a female to honeybees doing a waggle dance to indicate the location of food. In all of these cases, the brains must be able to process sensory information and guide appropriate behaviors. And as a neuroscientist, I'm very much interested in the question of how neural circuits can extract relevant sensory information and guide appropriate behaviors. As a systems neuroscientist, I work preferably at the scale of neural circuits where I would be able to measure and manipulate neural activity and figure out the logic of connection between these neurons uh, in order to understand how activity of these neural elements create behavior. So for example, in this case, do you have a pointer? Um, okay, so in this case, if you have a set of neural circuits with neural elements, it creates a particular behavior. We understand that this circuit gets set up via information in the genome through the process of development. So we are interested in understanding how neural circuits are set up. We are interested in understanding how once it's set up, it creates behavior. But we may also be interested in understanding how these behaviors evolve in the first place. So for example, if there's a change in the genetic instruction via developmental changes in the elaboration of brain areas, modification of certain connection strengths, or maybe even evolution of novel cell types, you can create these differences in neural circuit elements that may lead to a divergence of behavior. So these are the two questions that I'm interested in. How does sensory motor transformation work in the context of vocal communication? And how do these behaviors evolve in the first place? And these are probably some of the requirements if one is interested in these questions. Perhaps innate behaviors are better suited because you want to understand species typical behaviors. We rely on behavioral divergence among closely related species because we want to figure out the delta, the changes in neural circuits that creates these divergences. We are interested in understanding uh, neural circuits, so we want some degree of experimental tractability. For example, we should be able to breed them, uh, viral tools should work, et cetera. And finally, you know, for a large number of problems, there will be some animal of choice or few such animals on which it can be most conveniently studied. This is the Crocs principle. So depending upon our interest, which is in vocal communication, we um, study these singing mice from Costa Rica. So I'm introducing you to the protagonist of today's story. Um, these rodents are about 18 grams. They're slightly smaller than regular lab mice. They're found in the Costa Rican cloud forests. And they're remarkable in their ability to sing and to sing to each other, and turns out politely. OK, so I'm going to first introduce you to the behavior of these animals. And I think the best way of doing that is to just show you a video. So this is a video of one singing mouse isolated singing its song. And I think there's a set of things I have to do.
time um, every hour. So it's a pretty robust behavior. And as you can see, there's several aspects to it. There's a sensory motor aspect to it. The animal actually heard the auditory input. And there's even a delay that's between the sensory and the motor response where the animal is deciding whether it wants to respond or not. And that's not 100%. It's not a reflex. The response really depends upon what the auditory input is. And then this final production of the motor output that evolves over tens of seconds. Um, and I want to give you a sense of what it actually looks like if you measure it for about an hour or so. So here are vocalizations from mouse one and mouse two, two animals that we were recording for about one hour. And each of these blips, their uh, songs. But what is remarkable is that if you blow this up, you can see that they're not singing randomly, they're singing to each other. So the beginning of mouse two's songs, which is in red, seems to follow closely the end of mouse one's song, which is in black. And there are several behavioral motives that emerge. It's you know mouse one followed by mouse two, and sometimes mouse two initiates the bout, mouse one follows, and then back to mouse two. So we can do this quantitatively, and we can look at all such interaction bouts. And you can notice that two things. Um, there's very little overlap between the red and the black, which means that they're polite in their conversation. They don't interrupt. And secondly, the beginning of mouse's two song aligns pretty well to the end of mouse's one song. And roughly those time scales are about 500 milliseconds. And secondly, we notice that there's a degree of acoustic complexity that changes when they are engaged in social interaction. So not only is it the timing that gets adjusted, their ability to produce songs of various durations increases. So this is the variability of song duration, which is pretty stereotyped when they're singing alone, and then you know, a largely variable when they're singing social. And we know that the songs that are shorter than the solo songs come because of interruptions. And the songs that are longer, they are the responses. And typically, two males tend to compete in a way where the responder is going to increase the song duration, perhaps in a way to communicate fitness. So singing mice can flexibly modify response timing and song duration. We noticed further, and this is more recent, that the vocal complexity increases even more when we allow these animals to come physically close. So now I'm going to show you a video where uh, there are two animals that are interacting via a perforated chamber right here. And we are monitoring their location. We can track them. And we have designed this assay such that we have reasonable acoustic isolation that we can assign about 85 to 95% of vocalizations to individual animals. Um, I'm going to play this video. start making these down sweeps, these squiggly lines that we call trills, and there seems to be a distance dependence to it. So if we want to plot that, I mean, there are many ways of doing it. I'm just going to show you an example where you can take all of these vocalizations that are coming out and you can do some kind of a clustering method. It doesn't really matter what you choose, but basically we find that it falls into two such clusters. Those notes that compose the song, this is in cyan, and those all other kinds that are part of their near range communication. And if you look at some of these, they look like down sweeps, and these are the trills, and they also sometimes squeak. Overall, I think what's going on is that we have two vocal modes, one that's specialized for long distance communication, which are these songs, and one that's specialized for short distance communication that involves these ultrasonic-like vocalizations. Now we wanted to do a proper phylogenetic comparison of this. So we 
decided to do similar experiments in lab mice as well as in singing mice. And what we noticed is that now if we take even a simpler way of classifying this, just the duration and the max amplitude, we find that there is one mode that seems to be homologous in the lab mouse, which, is the, uh, which are the ultrasonic vocalizations. And then the song, it seems to be really a behavioral novelty that has come about in this particular species. And there are a couple of relatives of the species where they also show this behavior. So we think what we were calling calls is really like ultrasonic vocalizations. And we interchangeably now call them ultrasonic vocalizations. And songs are really a behavioral novelty in the species. Now, the hard problem of then comparing two different behaviors in two different species becomes slightly easier problem of comparing two different behaviors in the same animal if we are confident that this represents the ancestral mode. So what we will now want to do is to use these two behaviors to understand what are the exact changes in neural circuitry that allow these animals to have two vocal modes and how they might actually flexibly switch between each other. Once we have a behavior of this kind, perhaps it's reasonable to ask questions that can be uh, summarized in terms of Tinbergen's four questions. We might be interested in understanding the mechanisms that allow these animals to do so. So what stimuli can tra trigger these behaviors? What are the neural circuit mechanisms? Or we might be interested in understanding the evolutionary adaptive value of this. Why is it that these animals are making these kinds of vocalizations? How does it increase fitness? We might be interested in the ontogenic question. How does this behavior develop over time? Is it really learned? How similar is it to bird song, for example? And we can also ask questions about how did the behavior evolve? Is it shared by close related species? I'll give you a snapshot of what we know about their adaptive value. And this comes from work of Steve Phelps in UT Austin, who is a collaborator. What Steve did is he placed a female singing mouse in the middle and did a playback assay where he played back songs of different kinds through speakers and realized that the females tend to like songers, songs that are longer and have large uh, repetition rate, which turns out to be exactly the way the males tend to respond to other males. So we believe that there is some natural selection going on driven by females in, in building up this behavior. A little bit that's known about ontogeny is that turns out that these animals like other rodents would make, make pup calls up to about three weeks of age. And then from three to five weeks, they don't produce any vocalization. At the end of five weeks, they have a fully formed song, which also points towards the fact that perhaps singing per se is innate and does not require tutoring. But we don't quite know how circuits are, um, are evolving at this particular stage. And I think this is an interesting problem because this seems to be an androgen dependent maturation of certain pattern generating circuits that allows these animals to select in this case, a particular note, say the note A, which is a down sweep, make it louder and then come up with this temporal evolution that evolves over 10 seconds. But today I'm going to mostly talk to you about this main diagonal, the approximate mechanism of what might be the neural circuits that underlie some of this behavior, and this question of the phylogenetic relationship between behavior and neural circuits. Okay, so I want to start with vocal production because that's where we decided to start. And it's not surprising to think of the hierarchical control of vocal production as being a, a multi-layer control problem where you have to control respiration, laryngeal movements. There must be central pattern generators that control these. And then there's its midbrain and high level controllers on top of that, trying to influence many different things, even you know, the state and context in which those vocalizations are made. And there's a good evidence for thinking about this in a hierarchical sense from evidence in songbirds, where this has been beautifully characterized in terms of uh, motor production from HVC to RA and down to the respiratory areas. Even in midshipman fish work from Andy Buss's lab at Cornell, they find these hierarchical control of various elements of vocal production. So I think it's reasonable to think of this as a hierarchical motor control problem. So we wanted to start at the periphery. I think this should have been here. But nevertheless, it's close to the periphery. And we first wanted to know whether the production mechanism is different for the two modes, the songs versus USVs. So we did an experiment where we replaced the air with helium. And the idea is that if they are being produced by a whistle mechanism, like a flute, then you expect the fundamental frequency to go up. And we wanted to sure, make sure whether it's, you know, it's the same mechanism for both modes. And indeed, 
these are down sweeps, these are trills, and these are the song notes, you can very clearly see that in all cases, the frequency goes up during helium, which suggests that these are being produced with a whistle mechanism, and there does not seem to be a major peripheral production difference between the two modes. Well, that leads us to the central control of those mechanisms. So we wanted to go to the, to the midbrain, and we focused on this region called periaqueductal gray, which um, is a really important brain region for instinctive behavior. It's sort of an ancient multimodal integration area. And there's been a lot of literature on the role of PAG in vocalization, so it was a natural place for us to start. And I'm going to just give you, you know, examples of two experiments that we did. So in this experiment, we did optogenetic activation of CAMK2 positive neurons in the caudal PAG. And what we noticed is if you simply activate those neurons for a few seconds, we start seeing temporally patterned vocalization that resemble those down sweeps and trills that are part of this uh, USV repertoire. And this experiment uh, has been done by Katie Chida in lab mouse before, and we repeated it again just to make sure it works in our hands. And again, stimulation of a caudal PAG region produces its own species typical USVs. You can notice that the pitch is actually slightly higher for the lab mouse compared to the singing mouse. Now, this tells us that really from the production mechanism downstream of the PAG, the circuits are actually identical because you can directly activate it and get respiratory tuned vocal production, which is species typical. We did the converse experiment. We uh, used tetanus light chain toxin to do to synaptic sil silencing of those regions. And I'm not showing evidence for the USVs because they just animals become mute. But I'm going to show you something what happens to the songs in the process of them becoming mute. So what happens is this is the full song and we can plot the evolution of this song as note rate as a function of time. So it starts with a high note rate of about 20 per second and then goes down up all the way down to five. And this is very stereotyped for songs. What we noticed is that over time, the animal starts missing notes and they create patterning errors such that notes become progressively uh, uh, lost such that at the end of four or five days, the animal becomes completely mute. So what we think is going on is that neurons in the PAG, they control both vocal modes. You can activate them and you can get USVs. You can inactivate them and make the animal mute. But this is evidence that these neurons control something about patterning, which was previously absent in, in the literature of how PAG might be able to control so vocalization. So we are now looking into it even more carefully, trying to think about how exactly the circuit works, how does it integrate with downstream hindbrain pattern generators. Now I want to focus on the cortex, because uh, this is where, in fact, historically, um, we started while I was a postdoc with Michael Long. We had identified this orofacial motor cortical region through electrical microstimulation and stimulating in this region, which is OMC, which is homologous to ALM in lab mouse, if many people have know that literature, um, we can get robust EMG activity from muscles. And we had shown previously that inactivating OMC has a major impairment in their ability to uh, respond to auditory playback. So which provided us a good entry point towards studying new mechanisms in the motor cortex underlying this particular behavior. So we were curious about circuit modifications of motor cortex and whether that underlies elaboration of vocal repertoire. So firstly, we wanted to hypothesize that perhaps there are structural differences between the motor cortical projections in lab mouse versus singing mouse, and we should be able to figure out if we can understand using kind of comparative connectomics whether there are distinct brain-wide projection pattern differences that may underlie the behavioral differences. And this is not an easy problem, because if you look at the brains of the lab mouse and the singing mouse, they are very similar. It would be really hard pressed even for us to you know, guess correctly which, which slices come from lab mice versus singing mouse. So we don't expect major elaborations of brain areas. We don't expect a new brain area. It has to be something that would be you know, subtle. So we wanted to figure out uh, how we can do that. And we use comparative connectomics. And the idea is to, test for various hypotheses. So for example, 
given an ancestral circuit where motor cortical regions project to area A and area B, we could hypothesize that perhaps one would expect a novel projection to a new brain area, or perhaps you would expect not a novel projection per se, but increased projection strength to certain specific downstream brain areas. And we wanted to distinguish between these possibilities. So the first thing we did was inject viruses in motor cortex and follow uh, using two photon tomography, all the axons that emanate from motor cortex in the two species. And this is work from Emily Isco, my graduate student, Sure, why the video is not playing. Let me try. Okay. So you can follow the axons all through the brain after injecting in the motor cortex. And what we find is basically that uh, there aren't any qualitative differences in the brain wide projection targets. So actually, in here, there are two colors one for each species. And the fact that you don't see each color separately basically means that the projection targets at this bulk level seems to be very similar. We wanted to understand quantitatively if there is a difference. So for this, we had to resort to something uh, which is comparative connectomics using barcodes. When this experiment uh, is, um, is done in collaboration with Tony Zeder's lab, who was my neighbor at Cold Spring Harbor, where this was developed. And the idea is to inject a library of synbis virus in a brain region, say in the motor cortex. Each neuron takes up a particular barcode, which is 20 nucleotide long. This barcodes gets transported via axons to all the targets of these neurons. And then you can simply cut those regions and sequence them. So the problem of you know, anatomy becomes the problem of sequencing, which is somewhat easier to solve. And using experiments of this kind, you can recover connectivity profiles of 5,000 neurons in one animal. So this is one uh, singing mouse, one lab mouse and one singing mouse where each row is a barcode and presumably one neuron. And each column is a brain region that we cut out for sequencing. And the color code is how many barcodes we recovered, which is, a, which is proportional to the strength of projection. So overall, again, you see that you know, we recover the major classes, the IT neurons, the that that are that go within the cortex, the PT neurons that go to the brainstem, et cetera. But now we can actually get quantitative because we can calculate probabilities and we can calculate projection strengths, which we did. So for each of those columns, we can calculate for each animal, and there are five uh, lab mice and uh, seven singing mice in this case, what's the probability of connection? So it sum them up, divide by the total number of barcodes. And turns out that for most brain regions, there doesn't seem to be a difference, except for two. One is an auditory region, and the other one is the PAG. So in both cases, there seems to be an about three to four-fold increase in projection strength from the motor cortex to uh, these brain regions. We checked for an additional possibility, which is that this is about projection probability. What about arborization? Once it projects, does it have more axons? And that would correspond to, for individual neurons, what's the distribution histogram of barcodes? And that does not seem to be different. So I think what's going on is that there's increased projection strength from motor cortex to certain specific brain areas, in this case, an auditory region and PAG. And that's governed by the probability of connection as opposed to being arborization once it makes it there. Uh, these two species have those separated by millions of years, right? Like, what are these mutually related species? Like, if you took a non-species yeah. that's closer... Uh... It's a great question. So we thought about, you know, how to select these species. So there turns out that there are two other species that are intermediate phenotypes between lab mice and singing mice. But we weren't sure what would be the level of change that we, we would expect, because they do have songs. They don't have it elaborate enough. So the way we reasoned this is that we want to go to a closely related species to a degree where the song itself is a novelty to give us our best chance of figuring out a difference. But now that we know that there exists a difference, we can interpolate and we can get these species uh, and actually check whether the degree of projection strength correlates with the, you know, the degree of the phenotype. And that would be really very interesting. But we are not there yet. Is there any other question at this point? Do you know the extent to which these projections contact the CAMPAGE 2 population in the PG, which you manipulated, or how directly they might be involved with the other manipulations you relate to them? Absolutely. So, um, 
Great question. So when when we say we looked at the PAG, we actually designed it such that we looked at subdivisions of PAG because this is a sequencing problem. We actually cut up the PAG in multiple sort of anterior, posterior, dorsal, lateral um, domains. And we exactly know which regions of the PAG contributes to this increased projection strength. We are currently doing experiments to, to manipulate the specific projection from motor cortex to the PAG. It's ongoing, but I don't have uh, results for you. My hope is that part of the patterning is actually coming from motor cortex via PAG. Is it possible that maybe in the lab mouse they auditory cortex is schizophrenic in M2 instead of AL round four? Is it a problem that everybody's calling all these regions so different? It's a good question. So I think uh, the way we avoided or at least tried to deal with that nomenclature issue is our definition for from where we do our injection is based on EMG. So in both species, exactly that region, if you do intracortical microstimulation, you get EMG in the laryngeal and uh, jaw muscles. So our definition is that this is our starting point with some variability of about 500 micron of injection spread. Um, and I, I think this region that uh, we find in the auditory cortex is actually a ventral to the auditory cortex, not exactly in A1. And we now know from tracing experiments that there's a bi bi-directional loop between motor cortex and this auditory region. We are very interested in understanding if that bi-directional loop explains some of the bi-directionality of the vocal interactions. But this is not the same bi-directional loop that David would call M2. No, so for him, it's a lot more medial. Okay, so I think with these experiments, we uh, we think that there aren't any novel projections. However, there seems to be increased projection strength uh, in between specific circuit elements from motor cortex between the two species. Well, we also wanted to check for functional differences. And uh, given the fact that we now know that uh, the same animal will have two vocal modes, we can ask the question slightly differently, not by comparing lab mouse versus singing mouse, but in the same singing mouse, ask what might be functional differences between when they produce songs versus when they produce VSVs, which becomes slightly more tractable. So we are looking at motor cortex because of our previous work showing that uh, it has a functional relevance to this behavior. And we wanted to test the hypothesis that motor cortical neurons might be functionally specialized for the singing behavior. But before that, I'm going to tell you first what we know about what motor cortex does during the singing behavior itself. So, um, we had to go through a bit of technology development, trying to do chronic silicon probe recordings uh, in the singing mouse while they have to be able to carry it and still sing without any external reinforcement. Uh, that seems to work out reasonably well. We can record neurons uh, for about a month or so, um, and we get adequate neural activity and behavior such that we can start asking questions about neural dynamics in relationship to behavior. And the first thing we notice is that there you know, many different kinds of responses in the motor cortex, not surprising to people who follow motor cortic cortical literature. There are neurons that have, uh, that have signal that tends to rise up right before the song starts. There are neurons that have stop activity right at the end of the song. And then there are these neurons that show persistent activity either in either going up or being suppressed through the song. And we were really interested in understanding uh, what's the relationship of this neural activity with respect to behavior. And here, we wanted to leverage the natural variability of behavior. I told you, if you remember, that the song durations and their tempo can vary over 100%. So that gives us songs of various durations and tempo to try to understand the relationship between neural activity and uh, behavior. And especially in the context of uh, for example, are the neurons encoding something like absolute time or they're encoding something like relative time? And the difference will be that if you have a long song, if the neurons care about absolute time, the first portion of that song will be identical and maybe you'll have new neural dynamics or new neurons show up. However, for relative time, it's going to be the same shape, just going to be stretched depending upon how long the song is going to be. So we could check this and this is an example neuron, um, you're plotting the raster plot over 29 songs, uh, songs that are short to songs that are long. And 
uh, if you actually look at its PSTH, we find that you know songs that are short look like this, and then they progressively seems to stretch as the songs become longer. These are two other units that were measured in the motor cortex, um, and it seems that neural activity co-varies with song duration. But we wanted to go further and ask exactly how does it co-vary. So for this, what we did is we took pairs of um, pairs of PSTHs, so for example, this one and this one, and asked by how much should I compress the PSTH here? So what should be the scaling factor which would, that would best match this template that I'm trying to match? And if you plot that scaling factor on the ordinate and then plot on the abscissa, the, the ratio of the song duration, it seems to follow this perfectly linear relationship where it seems that the degree of stretching is proportional to the ratio of the song duration. And that's for this one neuron, and we can do this for 107 neurons from four animals, and the slope tends, it was basically, I think, 1.01 .01 plus minus 0 0.01, .01, which means that over tens of seconds, uh, it seems that neural activity is temporally scaling to match um, the pattern of activity remains identical, except the speed with which it progresses through that activity seems to be different. So we can rule out this model, and we think what's going on is the neurons in motor cortex tend to care about absolute time, so not one second, two second, but 10% or 20% or 30% of the behavior. And um, we wanted to check what this temporally scaled motor cortical input might be good for, so we built a very simple computational model where we thought that motor cortex is providing presynaptic drive to a pattern generator in the brainstem, maybe in the PAG, and the, and the usefulness of this comes through the fact that when there's a temporal scaling of firing rate in the motor cortex, the overall drive would also be scaled. So with the exact same setup of how drive gets converted into notes, we actually would expect songs of various durations. This particular setup makes a prediction that as songs become longer, they will become longer by incorporating more notes because the total number of notes would be proportional to the area under this curve. And that is a prediction that we can check. So we went into the natural behavior and really checked that uh, you know, when the songs vary, when the animals change the song duration, they do so by incorporating more number of notes. Additionally, if we cool motor cortex, the songs become longer, but unlike the bird here, it also becomes longer by incorporating more notes, which also suggests that motor cortical dynamics, the scaling seems to be presynaptic to a pattern generator and does not contain the entire time scale of the behavior. It just controls the tempo, the rate at which the songs evolve, and this is useful for And in some sense, we think that in order to be flexible, there is no, uh, no chance of invo invoking plasticity because the animals have to sing you know, a six second song and then a 12 second back to 18 seconds. So this is a way in which you can create flexibility without changing the, changing the synaptic weights directly. Um, okay, so we think what's going on is that motor cortex provides hierarchical control of vocal uh, timing. And we were interested in understanding if this activity is specialized for song compared to the USV. And this is still ongoing, but we can take the same set of neurons that we measure and align its activity to songs. And here I'm showing just 12 sets of, uh, I think 12 neurons over 40 songs. We can find similar persistent dynamics that I showed you before. But if you look at the same neurons, we have so far failed to recover any neuron that has any neural activity, which is peri, peri USV. So neither you know, in the beginning or during or after. So, so far it seems that neural activity in motor cortex seems to be specialized for songs, but not USVs. So what have, I, what have I showed you today? What we believe is going on in behavioral space is that the singing mouse has acquired a behavioral novelty, which they use for long distance communication, keep track of social interactions, perhaps in a way to impress the females. And when they get closer, they switch to the traditional ultrasonic vocalizations, um, and they have they, they do this because they are in the cloud forest of Costa Rica, and they do not have long distance visual access. So we believe that uh, having both these systems is actually adaptive to their behavior. We have shown some evidence of structural specialization of motor cortical projections in the two species, where it seems to 
be that motor cortical projection to specific areas such as the PAG and the auditory region has increased probability of connection. And finally, we find some evidence of functional specialization of motor cortical dynamics as well, where we know that motor cortex controls the, the duration and the tempo of the song, but does not seem to care much about the ultrasonic vocalizations. Looking ahead, this is, I think, a beginning of many interesting questions that can be asked in this species. One uh, set of questions are sort of traditional neural circuit mechanism questions where we have a sensory delay motor paradigm, but in this case, we don't have to engineer it into the behavior. This is what they originally do. So you can, we, I, we have so far focused, focused on, you know, vocal initiation and motor command, but you can ask questions about sensory evidence integration, the response probability, their ability to respond, their decision making in this case to whether respond or not, and do the entire sensory motor arc that's possible. On the other hand, we are also interested, extremely interested in asking questions about how these neural circuits that we may uncover differ between closed related species that show divergent behaviors. And this is an opportunity to identify differences in cell types, in connectivity, in neural dynamics that might lead to the delta in neural circuit space, giving rise to the delta in behavior space, which is a fun way of linking neural circuits to behavior. And this is my last slide. I want to end with slight speculation, which is that um, you're interested in this idea of where does evolutionary novelty comes from. And there's been a lot of study, for example, in development about where evolutionary adaptations to um, structural features come from, right? And there was a pretty remarkable set of findings showing that you know the mechanism of body plan of a drosophila has something to do with the mechanisms of body plan in humans even. So there seems to be a deep homology in the way components are used to create evolutionary novelties for morphology. And why not uh, such a mechanism exist for behavioral innovations? And the goal is there to find, you know, um, pairs of species that show large divergences of behavior in closely related genomic distance, and then identify directions on the circuit configuration manifold where a tiny difference, a delta circuit leads to an appreciable difference in delta behavior. And perhaps if we do it enough number of times in enough number of species, perhaps the space of all possible solutions is not as vast. And there are some conserved ways in which neural circuits evolve in order to confer new behavior. But that's a speculation. Um, I would like to end here by thanking the members of my lab. Uh, Cliff, uh, who is a postdoc who uh, spearheaded all the behavioral experiments. Mike Zeng uh, is focusing on the neurophysiology experiments in the PAG. Uh, Emily Isco, in collaboration with Tony Zedar, is uh, focusing on the connectomic uh, um, experiments. Yaman Thapa, who is a first year PhD student who just joined, is interested in modeling the, the periodic uh, singing behavior over 10 minute time scale, thinking about two animals as sort of independent. Um, oscillators and then coupling them during social interaction and seeing what exactly happens. And Martin, who is a senior technician, and the way who just started as a technician who is not there in the picture. I'd like to thank Tony Zedar and Ben Cowley, who are direct collaborators on some of the work that I showed you today. Um, immensely grateful to Michael, where I started working on the singing mice. Uh, and he is also part of the story on the temporal dynamics of um, motor cortex. And this was done in collaboration with Shaul Druckmann and his graduate student, Fong Chen, and Steve Phelps, who is in UT Austin and is the repository of all information about singing mouse behavior. And we often turn to him for advice, uh, some funding and core facility. And also we are hiring, so if anybody's interested, please get in touch. Thank you. So I think we can take some questions um, and maybe start with some of our students. Abigail. Oh, um, I talked to a student at that event and I was Good question. So 
I want to first mention that this particular projection and also the bidirectionality of the projection, you find it in the landmarks. It's just, it seems that it has increased the projection strength from water particles to the auditory. We don't even know if there is a concomitant increase in the other direction. We are currently working on that. What I think is, and we were talking about this before, I think some of these circuits for behavioral innovation is co opting, you know, circuits that are originally exist in, you know, in, in neighboring species. So I'd be very surprised if that particular projection does not have anything to do with vocalizations or auditory behavior in that I think they will. But I think this is an opportunity to then exactly ask what might be the differences between the two species, and that might tell us something about how exactly those projections are set up. So I believe that those projections will be important. We just don't know exactly at this point, but we're very interested to find. Let me ask a question mm -hmm. as a follow-up. Um, the motor cortex projection experiments, have you tried? Um, I'm just thinking, if you have two animals, the, the typical duration of the song seems pretty stereotyped. Uh -huh. If you um, either play back a sound that uh, starts to interrupt, mm -hmm. does that actually change the motor cortex activity immediately? Or, and also if you silence that activity, does that change the, the actual singing? We know behaviorally what happens. So behaviorally, uh, they, they actually are also very good at stopping. In, if, if, if in case there's a you know, breach of trust and the other animals start singing and not being polite, uh, they also within hundreds of milliseconds have an ability to stop, which is what results in those truncations. And we know those are truncated songs because we can look at the note evolution and it looks like the animal was about to make a 16 second song, but got it short. So uh, I think what's really interesting and we don't quite know is what happens to dynamics in the cortex, whether that is cortically controlled or you know, brainstem and PAG is good enough to control that. For the physiology experiment that I showed you, because it was the first time we were doing this in the species, I decided to do it with a playback assay because I didn't want variability from the other animal to you know, create problems. So in this case, it was just like, Playback response, playback response. So there wasn't an opportunity for interrupting. But now that we know what happens in that's exactly one of the questions that uh, I would like to answer. Because it's not necessary. Maybe the cortical dynamics progresses as if the song is going to be 16 seconds. But then there is a gating downstream that says no. no. Um, I'll let you take. <laughs> yeah, so I have a um, great talk. That was really cool. I guess. This is sort of two related questions. One is that do you think then USBs are just not controlled by cortex? It's entirely subcortical. And then the related question is like, I'm not an expert, but I thought the new model motor, motor cortex is we're not supposed to be looking at single neurons. Aren't we supposed to be looking at populations and a dynamical system and trajectories? And do you think maybe you would see some encoding of USBs or different kinds of encoding of songs? Yeah, good question. I mean, I'll answer the second one first <laughs> because we have actually done that. So actually my interest also is in neural dynamics and trajectories and I love the dynamical framework. In this case, it was sufficient to explain it at the level of individual neurons. So we looked at the entire dynamics, we find clusters of different kinds of neural activity. You know, I showed you a few different shapes. We looked at scaling of individual shapes and we found that all of those shapes individually scale. We looked at uh, all the core recorded neurons in the same same session, and we found that all of those neurons scale together. We looked at the difference between inhibitory neurons with, with spike shape versus projection neurons, presumably, and all of them scale together as well. So it seems to be a global phenomena where if you, I, I mean, my favorite way of thinking about it is in terms of neural trajectories, I like manifolds. So if you think about the manifold of neural activity and all of these neurons contributing to that, Songs of different duration are just going through exactly the same trajectory, but at different speeds. So you can come up with a, you know, a reasonably good description of this behavior in terms of manifold. But in this case, it just was easy enough to do it at the level of single neurons, which is what we did. Uh, for USBs, we don't have enough neurons yet to do that. We are building towards it. We are doing experiments so far. But with the neurons that we have so far, we recover the song activity of those neurons in exactly the same proportion that we saw in the previous study, but we have so far failed to see anything that is USB-like. Now the question of, is it controlled at all? 
I think that's hard question depends upon your manipulations, etc. Um, and there are several ways to approach it. And there's some evidence from um, work in lab mouse that if you have a decorticated lab mouse, there doesn't seem to be tremendous effects on the ability of the animal to produce USBs. Uh, I think the experiment that needs to be done, I would be really interested in doing, is to actually go back to the cooling experiment. Because, you know, I think that's a disruption to the neural activity, but on manifold, it's not like a hammer. So in some sense, if we can pull and then still elongate motor cortical control of songs, but to the USB time scale, then perhaps that would be one convincing evidence. Um, yeah. Yeah, I have a question about whether one this sort of more uh, maybe not what a social neurobiologist would do, but can you hook up this song production to an external reward like a sucrose drop mm -hmm. water and can? Could could you train them to do this for for rewards, and then could you like give more reward for longer song and see how <laughs> where they could control all this? I have thought of this. We were actually having this conversation with Alan in the morning, because one thing that surprised me is when we were doing these motor cortical recordings, the expectation was that we'll find a lot of uh, mixed selective activity, which has been described, lots of auditory activity, lots of neurons that show auditory and motor, and we would need complex dimensionality reduction. Turned out that it wasn't that complicated in the motor cortex of the singing mouse. Mm -hmm. Now, one possibility could be its species difference. It's the same brain area in some sense. But one other possibility might be that it is because this is an innate behavior where we didn't train the animals to sing for an external reward. But I think the way to show that would be to train the singing mouse for external reward and then uh, show if the representation of auditory and motor uh, you know, if you train them with respect to a pure tone sing and then get the sucrose water, if all of those get remapped and re represented into like, you know, the ALM homologue, which is what I'm saying. So, right. have you done? Oh, sorry. Yeah, Joe. Oh, hi. Um, it was a quick question. I was wondering, do you know, do we know what elicits the songs in the first place? Or is it like an aggression thing? Or is it that they're just chatting? And like, same for you as being, do we know? If what elicits USBs in this and the tropical same mice is the same as what elicits USBs in the great question. So turns out that these animals, even when they're isolated and alone, they will make a baseline level of songs over a given day. And that would be roughly of the order of hundred. Mm -hmm. And the reason they do this, I believe, is because they are unaware of their surroundings. And this is a way of pinging the world, right? Like occasionally, every 10 minutes. Singing, did I, did I hear a response? Did I hear almost like radars of a sonar thing, right? A thing. And then once you know, then you can hone in, you can go towards and then switch to this conventional mode of communication at short distances. So that's my mental image of how this works. Um, so sometimes they're just singing spontaneously. Where does the spontaneous drive come from? I don't know. We can evoke the songs very reliably using auditory playback. So audition is sufficient to drive this behavior. When the animals get closer, it seems they're more dependent upon olfactory input for USVs, and that's actually very similar to what is expected for USVs even in lab mouse. So there are lots of similarities, and there may be tiny difference in terms of the long distance usage. I have a follow-up question with that. Since you were talking about a lot of social dynamics, is there any change when the animal encounters like a Aggressor or an animal in on a high social hierarchy? Also, does it change with the internal rule of an animal because you were talking about community being more? Yeah, it's a it's a fair question. Uh, so far, we haven't played around directly with hierarchy. Uh, I think we plan to at some point. We haven't yet, but I think it would be really interesting to correlate all of these vocal features with hierarchy and to know exactly how you know, song effort maps onto hierarchy and their ability to respond or follow versus lead in these vocal interactions. We, we just don't know yet, but. After me. So in some of the um, early panels, which shows uh, both sort of in the question and answer phase, so um, obviously sort of song versus song, and then in another case, obviously, sort of A, B, A pattern. I was wondering how stereotyped is the sort of pattern of song followed by communication followed by the sheet? So the ABA pattern seems to only happen at the very beginning of interactions. So um, it tends to quickly die down because that's like a very high level of engagement. 
uh, that quickly dies down. Maybe the first hour is when you see this, and then it becomes the stable sort of B A B A B A B A. Now, um, what what is particularly interesting, and this is sort of preliminary observation, we haven't followed up on it, that if you have the same interaction again after five days, so it tends to be more often than not that they retain the order in which they sing. So it's still B A. Now, how does that get set up? You know, they must know this from just audio alone because there is no other piece of information. Uh, so that's interesting. If there's a long-term, you know, um, memory of that particular interaction order. So direct follow-up, is it the nine-minute mouse that goes first and the 12-minute mouse that goes <laughs> second? It's actually the, so initially the way we had done this, we had actually a resident intruder paradigm where we had a resident mouse and we bring the intruder mouse in. And we notice that the intruder mouse is the one that actually responds always. Okay, so it's a resident intruder or intruder, resident intruder. So we thought it was about resident intruder, but then in, in my lab, we reversed the paradigm. And then in some cases it's reversed, in some cases it didn't. What it correlated with is the volubility. How, many, how likely is an animal to sing even in the first place? So in some sense, it's really, so if a, a five minute interval mouse is likely to be the responder because it's the mouse that sings the most. And maybe that is how they communicate who should sort of take turns and who sh what should the order be. This is what Yaman, who wants to model this, wants to figure out. So I kind of have two questions. One is like, have you tried doing the cooling experiments in the PEG? No. So do you then expect the a node to expand? Is that sort of the equivalent of like? Yeah, I, I think the expectation would be that if you are at the pattern generator, you expect all time scales to expand the notes, the gaps, the entire songs. Now it's, I think Michael managed to cool RA, but it's a really hard experiment yeah. because, you know, cooling is limited by diffusion of heat. And for small structures, it's really hard. Uh, the guarantees that you are not cooling anything that is on top of PAG is hard to, you know, control for. But I think if we have additional evidence that PAG is where the temporal patterning happens, we also have predictions about what should happen to neural activity. Because at that point, if we can show that, you know, there's a patterning deficit, and if really PAG is the place where patterning is actually being generated as a downstream consequence of motor cortex, we actually have predictions about how neural activity in the PAG should look like. It shouldn't look like persistent dynamics. It should look like for individual nodes. And when the songs become longer, it should not scale. It should actually have more bursts because now the you know, notes, there are more notes. It should have predictable increase in the duration because the notes themselves increase. So, and if we do simultaneous measurement of PAG and motor cortex, any deviations in the motor cortex locally should get reflected in the deviation in the PAG. So I think there are ways to check this. I think I would love to do a cooling experiment, but I think there are technological issues that I'm not quite confident that I'll be able to solve. The second question that I had was, it's it's about these these the the middle level of the yes. time scale of the songs, yes. right? So it seems like so. Do you see any pattern to it? Like, is there like some circadian changes? Like, are they singing the shorter songs in the morning? Are they singing the longer songs in the evening? Or is there like is yeah, that, any that, character to read? Or are they? Is it a really a mixed bag? Are they just kind of like? No, I think it's not a mixed bag, which is what makes it sort of interesting. But I don't have good hypothesis at the neural you know, level at all. So I can tell you about the behavior. So what happens is that all of these animals have this strong morning bout of singing. Um, and that happens, they anticipate the light onset by 30 minutes, and they have this large bout that consists of maybe two hours of singing. If you look at the first hour, once they're settled into their rhythm, they're singing like about 10 songs in that hour. And what is remarkable is that those 10 songs are going to be placed every six minutes. Now, when the probability of singing drops, the same animal is now placing songs at you know, nine minutes or 12 minutes. So over the course of the day and over these ultradian bouts, that time period flexibly varies. And there are often also cases where, you know, it's like the match is not perfect. So, in some sense, this is an existence proof in my head that they're at least able to do it for a few hours, which also raises the interesting question of, about how they're doing it. Whether they're doing it continuously through the entire day just becomes harder because once the probability of singing drops, 
then it's really hard to know if it's a statistical artifact.